Hello everyone. This presentation will be on Dengue in Pediatric Practice. The presentation is made by the Indian Academy of Pediatricians 2015 edition along with some inputs from the World Health Organization guidelines for treatment of Dengue. Uh, I will be focusing upon some newer advances in treatment in between as and where the changes are relevant. We all know Dengue is a viral infection which is caused by a flavivirus belonging to flaviviridae family. It's one of the top 10 leading causes of hospitalization and death mortality in children, contributing to almost 25,000 deaths per annum and globally 20 million cases per year worldwide. As clinicians, we should know the typical as well as atypical presentations of dengue fever that will help in both early diagnosis and treatment, identifying the complications early and preventing complications from developing. Like I said, it is a flaviviridae virus. Uh, previously, literature showed that there was four subtypes. However, now scientists have found that there is a fifth subtype also and there is no cross protection between the different serotypes the viral size is just short of 100 nanometer in diameter uh, coming to the epidemiology the predominant vector is Aedes aegypti that is important from an exam perspective and from a public health perspective as well it is a daytime biting mosquito so that is important dengo bites are acquired during the daytime and this has been proven to cause epidemics all over the world except for Antarctica. Both Americas, Europe, Australia and Asia have been affected in one or the other form at different points of time because of dengue. Uh, this is just a picture showing Aedes aegypti. It's a spotter to identify the mosquito as well as Aedes albopticus. That's just more of an academic perspective. Uh, coming to the pathogenesis, uh, it was previously believed to be incompletely understood. However, recent theories do suggest internal redistribution of fluid, which results in hemoconcentration, subsequently resulting in hypovolemia, tissue hypoxia, resulting in hyponatremia and metabolic acidosis. This is all as a result of capillary damage. So that theory is important. Other theories include the rapid activation of the complement system, and circulating antibodies. So these infection enhancing antibodies at the time of infection are the strongest risk factor. That also explains why the infection is more severe for some than it is for others. Um, this slide is pretty important. It basically classifies dengue into both with and without warning signs and subsequently into severe dengue. So when I come to with warning signs, we have something what is called probable dengue. Probable dengue is where the person lives or has traveled to an endemic area, has fever along with two or more of the following, nausea, vomiting, rash, aches and pains, tonicate test positive, which is also called HES test, leukopenia and any warning sign. Or lab confirmed dengue, meaning the NS1 antigen positive or IgM positive as the two lab confirmed test. Now coming to HES test or the tonique sign, just imagine that this is the arm of the individual. You tie a BP cuff, raise it to the systolic blood pressure, keep a bell of the stethoscope exactly in the cubital fossa. Imagine that is a cubital fossa and watch for petit If you see more than 10, that is tonique test positive. More than 10. The bell of the stethoscope corresponds to 1 square inch. That is another point which is very important. That was probable dengue. Subsequently, we are looking at warning signs. The warning signs in dengue is nothing but abdominal pain or tenderness, persistent vomiting, clinically fluid accumulation. It could be either in the form of pedal edema, it could be ascites, it could be pleural effusion, mucosal bleed of any extent, generalized lethargy or restlessness, liver enlargement clinically of more than 2 cm palpable, and 
lab investigation of a rise in hematocrit which is concurrent with a decrease in platelet count in dengue we remember the rule of 20 20% change in hematocrit it could be either increase or decrease significance of that we'll come to it afterwards but for now remember 20% either increase or decrease and subsequently a decrease in platelet count less than 20,000 okay okay so that was dengue with warning signs moving on uh, if we come to the entity known as severe dengue the criteria for single, severe dengue is severe plasma leakage which can result in dengue shock syndrome that is shock or fluid accumulation which results in respiratory distress severe bleeding clinically or severe organ involvement where the liver enzymes are raised into thousands there is altered consciousness or the patient has gone into multi-organ dysfunction syndrome because of cardiac involvement I'll highlight the top of this slide and spend a few minutes here. One thing we should understand when we have dengue with or without warning signs. Dengue with warning signs is definitely likely to lead to severe dengue and is managed properly. Dengue without warning signs can also lead to severe dengue without manifesting as warning signs. What I'm trying to say is dengue whether with or without warning signs can result in severe dengue and must not be taken lightly. This graph is a favorite for all examiners from an exam perspective and it is a very easy and simple way to understand the pathogenesis of dengue. Clinically we classify it into three phases as you can see highlighted at the base of the slide. First being the febrile phase, next being the critical phase, thirdly being the recovery phase. We'll go one by one. In the febrile phase, there will be an intermittent fever of high grade, may be associated with chills, not always. Fever will come, it will be a high grade fever, responds only to medication and it will subsequently drop. The critical phase is where the temperature remains stagnant. Rehabilitation phase, it is totally normal. As the name itself suggests, febrile phase, fever present, critical phase, fever absent, rarely may be febrile but usually absent, subsequently becomes normal. So we have seen the first parameter namely that is the fever. Subsequently there is a risk of dehydration during the febrile phase. That is okay, it can be corrected. I encourage the patient to take more oral fluids. It can be corrected if required supplement by IV fluids. What is worrisome, you can go in for shock or bleeding during the critical phase. Critical phase, critical issues, shock and bleeding is what we associate with dengue. Recovery phase, there is reabsorption. Whatever fluid has already gone into the cap because of capillary leakage will try to come back. If you are already overloaded with fluids, there will be a fluid overload. This is one point which I would like to highlight. Organ impairment is there both in the febrile phase, in the critical phase as well as in the recovery phase. Okay. So like I was saying, there is organ impairment possible in both the febrile phase, critical phase as well as in the recovery phase. To the common man, dengue fever is synonymous with a fall in the platelet count. However, from a clinical perspective, we should consider both platelet as well as hematocrit. Hematocrit is nothing but the packed cell volume. So we will have a baseline hematocrit and you have a baseline platelet count. From a common man perspective, platelet count will be normal in the febrile phase. More or less, how much ever the baseline of that individual is, it will be normal. When we come to the critical phase, there will be a crash in the platelets. In the words of a common man, there will be a crash in the platelet count. 
Nothing to worry. Give reassurance. Unless it shows manifestations, no need to do anything purely on the basis of the platelet count. And once you reach the recovery phase, platelet count will increase once more. Coming to hematocrit. The hematocrit will be normal in the initial stage. Okay, sorry. Previous slide. Before marking, I'll zoom in. So, we have the febrile phase, critical phase and recovery phase. The baseline hematocrit will assume it to be 35. 35 to 45 is normal. But for assumption's sake, we will take 35. We said that 20% of rise or fall is significant. So, a fall of 20% comes to 28. 20% 20 of 35 is 7. An increase of 7, that is 42. So, anything beyond 42 or 28 is considered as significant and abnormal. For just assumption's sake. So, we'll assume that the baseline hematocrit is 35. There will be a hemoconcentration during the critical phase. This hemoconcentration is because of the capillary loss. There is a loss of the fluids. Because of the loss of the fluids, the blood becomes thick. So, there is a hemoconcentration. If it becomes 42, that is, it is a 20% increase. It requires an intervention. It requires additional amount of fluids to be supplemented with caution. What is not shown in this chart is if there is a fall in the hematocrit. So, follow the dotted line. The hematocrit is normal and there is a crash in the hematocrit value. This crash in the hematocrit value means there is a reduction in the packed cell volume which is in circulation. The only way that can happen in dengue explained by capillary loss is internal bleeding. A rise in hematocrit rise in hematocrit requires IV fluids. NS. Fluid of choice NS. Whereas a fall in the hematocrit requires whole blood. This is one point which I want to make very clear. A rise in the hematocrit means there is hemoconcentration. If there is hemoconcentration, we need to supplement with IV fluids. If there is a fall in the hematocrit, we need to supplement with whole blood, never with individual components. Serology, in the initial stages, you can test the antigen in the febrile phase, that is NS1. And subsequently, you can check for IgM, IgG. There is another slide to show that. This is a summary once more. We'll just go over it once more because this is important. Febrile phase, there will be a temperature present. Temperature may be persisting into the critical phase or it will become normal. Recovery phase, temperature is normal. Febrile phase, the common uh, clinical issue seen is dehydration. Shock and bleeding is commonly seen in the critical phase. And in the recovery phase, there will be reabsorption and fluid overload. If fluid is not given properly, but organ impairment can be seen in any of the phases. Uh, lab changes, platelet count will be normal in the febrile phase, it will crash in the critical phase and in recovery phase, as the name suggests, it is recovery. Hematocrit may rise or fall. A rise in the hematocrit suggests hemoconcentration. Fall in the hematocrit suggests internal bleeding. Viral load will be higher in the febrile phase. That is where you can test the antigen. Subsequently, antibodies is better tested. Continuing with the investigations in Dengue, we have the baseline investigations which are done between the first and the fifth day of fever. What is commonly done is NS1 which is non-structural protein 1. You have certain rapid tests as well as ELISA. The ELISA will take a day whereas a rapid test will give its results in minutes. For the research purpose, you do have viral isolation based on mosquito cell culture and real-time PCR as well as immunohistochemistry also. But from a clinical perspective, NS1 antigen is most commonly done. From an entrance exam point of view, you should know that this antigen was discovered and is in use since 2006. Coming to the antibody response, you have certain short-term antibodies and certain long-term antibodies as well. 
by short term antibodies i means it takes 5 days for production and subsequently will last for 2 to 3 months that is nothing but dengue igm whereas igg is seen for past infections which often takes months up to years so that is igg so i repeat this once more you have dengue igm which is a short term antibody and dengue igg which is a long term antibody the detection of which by elisa will take around 1 to 2 days whereas uh, neutralization will take 7 days you also do have the card kit which will give the response if you have a person infected with dengue for the first time the first time his production will be igm and that production will happen within 5 days so 5 days is a cut off at which you can start testing for dengue igm this igg will take few months uh, some books say 8 months some books say 9 months on average we can take 8 to 9 months what is important to note there is a curve at which this dengue igm flat lines and becomes zero some books say it lasts for 3 months recent studies have shown it can last up to 6 months in some individuals post an infection but we can take a cut off of 6 months practically we do take it as 3 whereas igg is seen in a second time infection and the shoot up will happen often so if you have igg present then it means that the person was priorly infected previously a dramatic shoot up of igg will suggest that the person was infected previously we'll go through this chart one by one if an individual is ns1 positive igm negative igg negative it means he is infected for the first time and the infection has happened less than 6 days back similarly if he is ns1 positive igm positive igg negative it means he is infected for the first time and the duration of the infection is more than 6 days if he is ns1 negative but igm positive igg negative he is infected for the first time and it is more than 6 days ns1 is sometimes negative in up to 30% of all cases of dengue and it disappears by 8th day of fever so if you do the test on the 8th day he will be igm positive but ns1 negative likewise if he is ns1 positive igm negative but igg positive then it is nothing but a past infection and there is no infection for the second time if we consider a situation where all three are positive that is ns1 igm igg all three positive then it is a second time infection with a past infection also likewise ns1 positive igm negative and igg positive is also a second time infection igg positive implies he was previously infected ns1 positive implies he is currently infected so this table is very important moving forward as far as case management is concerned we do have a presumptive diagnosis in which he would have either gone to an endemic area or he lives in the endemic area and he has fever with any two of the following namely anorexia nausea aches and pains warning signs leukopenia tonicate as positive or rash like i mentioned in the previous slides warning signs being abdominal pain tenderness persistent vomiting fluid accumulation mucosal bleeds lethargy hepatomegaly or rise or fall in hematocrit more than 20% if any of these are positive then we treat it as dengue with warning signs which comes under group b group b meaning requiring hospital care broadly we see group a requiring home management sufficiently group b requiring hospital care group c requiring intensive care to call severe dengue it means that he has warning signs with severe manifestations such as mu- large amount of mucosal bleed large amount of internal hemorrhage large amount of blood loss vitals not maintaining will come under severe dengue but if the individual is having having none of these but is able to take feeds orally fever is subsiding otherwise symptomatic vital stable dengue without warning signs uncomplicated dengue it can be managed on home management but if coexisting conditions are there with other social circumstances which warrant an admission he must fall under the group b category this classification is important for the management of dengue fever this table summarizes it once more i will stress upon group c group c are patients in which the patient came in shock or fluid accumulation when i say fluid accumulation in dengue i am referring to pleural effusion gross ascites gross pleural edema with or without respiratory distress severe bleeding or severe organ impairment going for multi organ dysfunction syndrome 
supposing we get the patient who is in compensated shock then we initiate the intravenous fluid therapy at 10 ml per kg over the first 1 hour the fluid of choice is always and always normal saline normal saline and normal saline unless proven otherwise if improving over the next 1 to 2 hours slowly taper slowly taper to 5 to 7 and then taper to 3 to 5 and then reduce to 2 to 3 ml per kg per hour and subsequently allow oral feeds so like i was saying the trick is you start it at 10 if improving reduce it to 7 if reducing if uh, sorry if improving go to 5 if further improving go to 3 and then allow orally but if worsening you can go for a second bolus of 10 to 20 ml per kg up to 20 ml per kg is allowed for a bolus a bolus in dengo is always to go over 1 hour if there is improvement after the second bolus then reduce again to 7 again reduce to 5 then again reduce to 3 as in the previous one but if there is no improvement and the hematocrit is continuously decreasing then remember it is an indication of internal bleeding must and must always give whole blood whole blood and whole blood never individual paxils similarly if we get the patient who is in hypotensive shock hypotensive shock is an indication to start resuscitation with 20 ml per kg to be given over 15 minutes not 1 hour over 15 minutes and then check for improvement if improvement continue to give ns at 7 to 10 ml per kg per hour for 1 hour then reduce as in the previous case to from 7 to 5 5 to 3 maintain to over 6 to 10 hours and then slowly check and allow orally if the hematocrit increases at that time or is too high give one more bolus fluid and it will subsequently reduce the hematocrit if rising too much that is if the patient was improving on uh, uh, normal saline if the patient was not improving at that point to check hematocrit we would have given the first bolus it will take 15 minutes second correction will go over 1 hour that gives us sufficient time to check for the hematocrit if the hematocrit is rising then administer the second bolus over half an hour to 1 hour and check for improvement if no improvement and the hematocrit is rising continue to give fluids because hemo concentration is happening we want to dilute but if the hematocrit has fallen below 20% then check for signs of in, in uh, over bleeding check for signs of internal bleeding and consider giving whole blood if necessary if again by this time in at the initial point itself the hematocrit was decreasing initiate a whole blood transfusion because it means there is an internal bleed when it comes to monitoring the shock state uh, basically this is what we call as a dengue chart what is important to check is a urine output the urine output target is always minimum of 0.5 ml per kg per hour always the target is to keep it as 1 ml per kg per hour this is our target if it is going towards 2 then reduce of iv fluids if it is going below 5 increase fluids it is going towards anuria vitals are to be monitored regularly apart from vitals check for the peripheral pulses check for the pulse volume check for the pulse character check for the bp we always want to maintain a 50th centile of the bp check for hematocrit every 6 hourly and look for signs of pleural effusion and ascites the best and best sign to check for pleural effusion is by basal krebs on auscultation so i'll just draw the rungs roughly if this is the lungs and you're auscultating posteriorly check for basal krebs check for ascites check for pleural edema these are all signs of fluid overload the important thing is avoid a fluid overload because if you do consider the pathophysiology in dengo because of increased capillary permeability the fluids do come into the extracellular component so whatever limited fluids were there if it all comes out when the pathogenesis is settled all this fluid will eventually try to come back at that point is when it will lead to a fluid overload so our aim is always and always to give adequate iv fluids never too less and never too much similarly hematocrit rise or fall like i mentioned is to be maintained at a target of 20% i gave the example of target pcv of 35 a fall of 20% will come to 28 a rise will give a pcv of 42 
so between 28 and 42 everything is normal anything above or below is abnormal and requires intervention a decrease in hematocrit with unstable vital signs is an indication for action decrease in hematocrit suggests there is internal bleeding must and must compensate with whole blood rise in hematocrit means that there is hemo concentration hemo dilution is to be done by giving iv fluids calculation is always to be given for the fluids for only 24 hours target is save the patient keep the patient alive for 24 hours and 24 hours reassess recalculate iv fluids must and must never ever go double the maintenance recent advance in a dengue conference held at apollo chennai in september 2019 a panel led by eminent dr dr suchitra ranjit has now suggested never go beyond one and a half maintenance so if the maintenance fluid for a 10 kg child comes to 1 liter per day never ever go beyond 1.5 is the recent advance what the experts suggest similarly to identify respiratory distress early and uh, any patient with dengue go for a chest x-ray if it shows pleural effusion start on a colloid early if it's showing pulmonary edema give a diuretic early Go for fluid restriction. Like I mentioned, never ever give over amount of IV fluids. Never give under amount of IV fluids. And always maintain the pulse volume. Clinicians, it's a common dilemma what we do face as to knowing when to stop IV fluids definitely. The definitive signs and symptoms to stop IV fluids are features of intravascular compartment overload, hypertension with a good volume pulse, breathing difficulty with pulmonary edema, or 48 hours after complete tapering and effervescence. If you look at the complications of dengue fever as a whole, uh, fluid overload is definitely hydrogenically induced. Uh, respiratory distress and failure is again because of the fluid overload. Molecular organ dysfunction of the liver, kidney and neurological system is because of the complications associated. It can be because of the pathogenesis of the virus itself. It can also be because of the uh, fluid pathology where the, there is a shift between the extracellular and the intracellular components. Severe bleeding and DIC is a complication of the disease itself and it is the most important uh, complication to watch out for. It is the most common warning sign which is known to the public. It is the most common warning sign which we look for. Prolonged and profound shock is another complication. What can happen is the patient will be stable, vitals will be stable now. 15 minutes later vitals can crash. So that is another important thing to keep an eye on. As far as the prevention is concerned, uh, it is of course known that anti-mosquito measures to be taken, insecticides are definitely used, people do prefer full uh, body covering at the time of the dengue season. While storing water, of course, keep a tight fitting lid, uh, larvicides such as abate are used, sprays are used. Currently a vaccine has been licensed called Dengvaxia. Uh, that is of course the recent advance as far as a vaccine is concerned. It is currently on trial in the Philippines. Uh, it will come to the market, we don't know when, but when it is safe, we will see how best it can be used. Dengvaxia is the vaccine which is currently on trial. I thank you all for your patient listening. The purpose of this presentation was targeted at uh, medical students, undergraduate level, uh, postgraduate level for uh, brush up of the basics and uh, to an extent for the knowledge of the general public. As far as the general public and patient's perspective is concerned, this presentation cannot replace the advice of a registered medical practitioner. So if any dengue related doubts or any diagnosed as dengue or suspected dengue, please contact your medical practitioner. This presentation is not a substitute for that. This is targeted from an academic perspective. Thank you all for your patient listening.